All right. The last signal processing uh, process that we're going to talk about is what's called Fourier analysis, which allows us to see a dynamic signal in the frequency domain. So let's figure out what, what exactly that means. Those are some words that may not have a lot of meaning to you. So uh, what it does is it changes the representation of a complex signal. So we've said that a lot of dynamic signals are sums of um, simple signals. Um, and that can contain a lot of information. You know, you think about something like a radio signal, that's, that's just a wave, it's just a signal, but there's so much information in there uh, because it's a complex signal um, that it can reproduce someone's voice, it can re reproduce sounds and music and so forth. What Fourier analysis does is it takes that complex signal and it breaks it down into a sum of a bunch of sine and cosine functions that have different uh, frequencies and amplitudes and phases. Um, and a nice physical analog to that is a, is a prism. So when we have white light, white light is a nice example of a complex wave. Uh, when a, that wave hits a prism because of the different uh, speeds of light in this material for different frequencies, it breaks that um, that complex signal into a bunch of simple signals, into um, a spectrum of different sim simple signals. Uh, and we want to do the same thing with uh, uh, s types of signals that are complex uh, that aren't necessarily light. And that's what Fourier analysis does, not physically like a prism, but mathematically. So we talked a little bit uh, in an earlier uh, lecture about the fact that a complex wave is a sum of sine and cosine waves. Uh, and I, we use this example here um, of plucking a string uh, and the way that that string would then vibrate with these different harmonics in it uh, and that the signal uh, would look or the wave that was produced would look like this, we can represent, this is called the time domain here, and we'll see that in a second. We can represent that, um, that signal in what's called the frequency domain over here, which tells us, okay, what's there? Well, we've got a first harmonic uh, with a large amplitude. We've got a third harmonic with a smaller amplitude, and we've also got a fifth harmonic with an even smaller amplitude. And the fact that each of those has different amplitudes changes the shape of that signal, of that wave there. More widely, we can do that with any kind of signal, not just something that has harmonics in it. Uh, and so that's where we end up with our frequency and our time domain here which really are just describing, the, the names of those are describing what our x-axis is, right? Our time domain has time on the x-axis. Uh, the frequency of the domain has frequency on the x-axis. And so this image here, which I think is a trumpet um, uh, playing an E, uh, shows us this is not easy to understand, right? This in terms of like what is the what's in that signal what is that signal doing uh, it's really hard to see that but we put that in the frequency domain and all of a sudden we can see oh we've got harmonics here right this is about you know 325 this is maybe about 650 this is about 975 so we've got a first and a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth harmonic there um, and it's actually a pretty simple wave, right? It's, it's not, we're not adding a whole bunch of different uh, simple waves here, uh, but really just, you know, what do we have? Six here and maybe, um, maybe some more off the page, but um, it's not as complex as it looks at all. That's the heart of data reduction and signal processing is trying to make something that looks hard to understand and turning it into something that's easier. Uh, and the frequency domain can often do that for us with particularly with a deterministic uh, repeating signal. So how does this work? You know, what is, how do we get from the time domain to the frequency domain? Uh, and the answer is really amazing. <laughs> and I, I'm not, I, I, we don't have time in this class to fully uh, explore that, 
uh, but we use what's called a Fourier transform. And let's look just a little bit at this math. One, notice that um, over here we're integrating the time domain, right? A function in y of t. So this is our x-axis. And it's transforming it into the frequency domain over here where we have a y-axis um, and an x-axis that's in, that's in the frequency domain. That omega is our frequency. Um, the other thing to notice is that the complex number here, that negative i there, uh, e to the negative i um, can, has an a, a identity which produces that as um, a sine plus a complex cosine um, or vice versa. Um, and so this term is actually a bunch of sine and cosine waves. So we're integrating, um, we're multiplying our, the function in the time domain, right? That complex wave times a whole bunch of sine and cosine waves. That's what this is. Um, if this guy is similar to one of these sine waves, then they're going to multiply each other and the integral of that particular sine wave with that omega value is going to be large. If this, the wave that we, in the time domain that we're trying to transform doesn't have much that's in common with, remember this is a pile of different sine and cosine waves. So we're sort of working through one wave after another after another and we're integrating each one if for a particular omega that there's not much similarity here then you're going to get the the product of the two is going to randomly move between above the zero axis and below positive values and negative values and when we integrate that you're going to get essentially zero and so that's not going to add for that given omega that's we're not going to have a big value over here. I don't know how much of that you <laughs> you're following, but it's really amazing math. It's really super, uh, super cool stuff. So um, the, the, the big idea is that it, we're running through a bunch of omegas here, a bunch of frequencies. If that frequency, which represents the, the sine and cosine waves associated with that, are similar to our time domain value, we're gonna get a big value over here. And for, so for instance, in our frequency domain, this is a big value at, I think this is a clarinet, at 700 Hertz, right? This guy is big, you know, but here at 2600 Hertz, it's not very similar to the wave being produced by that clarinet. Uh, and so you get a value uh, in the frequency domain that's, that's very small. Okay, so that's a Fourier transform, and <laughs> and you know, I, I, the the math of that is I, I want you to just recognize how interesting and kind of cool the math is, um, but it's not really a main focus of of our work here, um, and so the effect of is that we get a plot that looks like this one over here, right, where we've gone from a time domain plot. But through this transform, we've turned it into a plot in the frequency domain, where each one of these frequency values gets a, a defined y uh, value that's either large or small. Okay. The degree that we can figure out, um, in other words, how accurate this guy is, depends in part upon our discretized uh, signal. Okay. So if we have a lot of sample points in, a, in this value, in, our, in this plot, uh, and the sampling rate is really fast, um, then our uh, Fourier transform is going to be better. Our frequency domain plot is going to be more accurate. And in the short, short way of saying that, more samples we take at a higher frequency, uh, we're going to have a better transform. All right, so poor sampling decisions can lead to misleading data. So we wanna make sure that when we do a, a Fourier transform that we're taking enough data 
that we get a good transform, especially when we're using discrete data. And so you need an actual notice, you know, that integral that we saw on the previous page isn't going to work with discrete data. And so we have use what's called a discrete Fourier transform, which is just a, an algorithm that uh, is trying to duplicate that, uh, that integral in a discrete way with discrete data. Um, and the big parameter that concerns us with that is our, uh, our delta F here, which is our frequency resolution. So you can see on this plot, uh, which is just a, a zoom of the plot on the previous page, right? Clearly we have a data point here and here and here and here. We don't have data points in between those. And that means we don't have exact data in between those, right? One of those problems with data reduction, we're losing some information here. Uh, but that delta F is telling us how well we're able to capture, you know, this is maybe telling us, I can't see the numbers here, but let's say this is 357 hertz and maybe this is 348 hertz. That means for all of those frequencies in between there, we're not really capturing exactly what's happening. And so the smaller we can make that delta F, the better. And the smaller that we make that means the more data points at a faster sampling rate. Okay, so if our if we don't take enough data, in other words, our, our frequency resolution uh, is too big, um, we don't have enough data points, we can run into a couple of problems. One is called attenuation. Uh, and that just means this, this plot over here is a frequency domain representation of a 100 hertz signal uh, with an amplitude of 10 volts. And so ideally our frequency our transformed frequency domain plot should show one line at 100 hertz that goes all the way up to 10. The fact that it doesn't, that we have a, um, the highest um, value here is closer to nine than 10 is because of a loss of information from our discretization process, right? When we transformed this, we didn't have enough data points to give us a really accurate um, uh, frequency domain representation. The other problem you notice here uh, is that we don't identify exactly the frequency, right? This was a 100 hertz signal. We should just have that one line at 100 hertz. Instead, that line is at 98 hertz. And you can understand why if you think about uh, frequency resolution, right? This up here tells us that our delta F is 9.8 hertz. So what this frequency domain representation is able to do is provide one line at 9.8, the next line at 19.6, the next line 9.8 higher than that. In other words, the distance between each of these lines here is 9.8 hertz. Um, and since we start at zero, uh, we can get a line at 98 hertz but we actually don't have a line uh, at, we don't have a data point at 100 hertz. Uh, and so it's gonna tell us not exactly um, what's going on here. It's gonna, it's gonna uh, distort our information a little bit uh, because of uh, the process of discretization. And that's pretty common with discrete Fourier transforms. It's hard to get um, things that are gonna identify exactly what your data is. Uh, and I think we'll see that in some of our labs, okay? And that's uh, Fourier transforms for you.